Okay, the first uh, readings I'm going to do today are by Lawrence Ferlinghetti in his Coney Island of the Mind, which turns out to be one of the most frequently published books of poetry that there are. So although the poetry, there are a few poems that um, incensed some people and a, uh, they were tried to arrest him. He won the freedom of speech uh, trial and so then the problems didn't, ha didn't occur again. I'll read a little bit. He died in February and so I, and it was just by happenstance that he was one of the poets I selected. So I'm gonna just read a few um, selections from the newspaper article because they really give you a sense, I think, of him. And I remember reading him. I got this book in college for one of the English classes I took. And um, you can tell how old it is because it was a dollar. I don't think they even have books that are a dollar these days. Lawrence Ferlinghetti, a poet publisher and political iconoclast who inspired and nurtured generations of San Francisco artists and writers from City Lights, his famed bookstore died on Monday at his home in San Francisco. He was 101. While older and not a practitioner, of the beat poets, their freewheeling personal style, Mr. Ferlinghetti befriended, published, and championed many of the major beat poets, among them Allen Ginsberg, Gregory Corso, and Michael McClure. Allen Ginsberg also had a suit brought against him uh, for the poem Howl and that poem is one of the most frequently read and certainly in English classes, although not as often as it used to be. Um, in, and in a First Amendment decision, he was acquitted and Hal became one of the 20th century's best known poems. The trial was the centerpiece of the 2010 film Howl in which James Franco played Ginsburg, and Andrew Rogers played Mr. Ferlinghetti. Unfortunately, I don't know who either of those two actors are, so that paragraph was lo lost on me. In addition to being a champion of the beats, Mr. Ferlinghetti was himself a prolific writer of wild, wide talents and interests whose work evaded e easy definition, mixing disarming simplicity sharp humor, and social consciousness. I don't think I'm going to read any more of this. Um, and if you're interested, you can look at it after, afterwards. So this is the Coney Island of the mind. And Ferlinghetti himself wrote I know it's here somewhere. Here we are. The title of this book is taken from Henry Miller's Into the Nightlife. It is used out of context, but expresses the way I felt about these poems when I wrote them, as if they were taken together, a kind of Coney Island of the mind, a kind of circus of the soul. So now the poems. Some of the poems have names, and some, some of them, most of them, are numbered. Okay. Hmm. No, but 
sorry. Sometime during eternity, some guys show up, and one of them who shows up real late is a kind of carpenter from some square type place like Galilee. And he starts wailing and claiming he is hep to who made heaven and earth, and that the cat who really laid it on us is his dad. And moreover, he adds, it's all writ down on some scroll type parchments, which some henchmen leave lying around the Dead Sea somewhere, somewhere long time ago, and which you won't even find for a couple of thousand years or so, or at least for 1947 of them to be exact. And even then, nobody really believes them, or me for that matter. You're hot, they tell him, and they cool him. They stretch him on a tree to cool. And everybody after that is always making models of this tree with him hung up and always crooning his name and calling him to come down and sit in on their combo as if he is the king cat who's got to blow or they can't quite make it. Only he don't come down from his tree. Him just hang there on his tree looking real petered out and real cool and also, according to a roundup of late world news from the usual unreliable sources, real dead. That is one of the poems that was not very nicely received. Um, I taught that poem in high school, and I got censured for teaching it. This is another poem. In Golden Gate Park that day, a man and his wife were coming along through the enormous meadow, which was the meadow of the world. He was wearing green suspenders and carrying an old beat up flute in one hand, while his wife had a bunch of grapes, which she kept handing out individually to various squirrels, as if each were a little joke. And then the two of them came on through the enormous meadow which was the meadow of the world, and then at a very still spot where the trees dreamed and seemed to have been waiting through all time for them, they sat down on the grass without looking at each other and ate oranges without looking at each other and put the peels in a basket, which they seemed to have brought for that purpose without looking each at each other. And then he took his shirt and undershirt off but kept his hat on sideways, and without saying anything, fell asleep under it. And his wife just sat there looking at the birds which flew about, calling to each other in the silly air as if they were questioning existence or trying to recall something forgotten. But then finally, she lay down flat and just lay there looking up at nothing, yet fingering the old flute which nobody played, and finally, looking over at him without any particular expression except a certain awful look of terrible depression. This is number nine. See, it was like this when we waltzed into this place, a couple of papish cats is doing an Aztec two-step. And I says, Dad, let's cut. But then this dame comes up behind me, see, and says, you and me could really exist. Wow, I says, only the next day she has bad teeth and really hates poetry. I think that's very funny. Okay. This is number 14. Don't let that horse eat that violin, cried Chagall's mother. But he kept right on painting and became famous and kept on painting the horse with violin in mouth. And when he finally finished it, he jumped up on the horse and rode away wa waving the violin. 
and then with a low bow gave it to the first naked nude he ran across, and there were no strings attached. Now they they changed they have the same numbers but they're different This is number 7 from a different set of poetry Fortune has its cookies to give out, which is a good thing. And since it's been a long time since that summer in Brooklyn, when they closed off the street one hot day and the firemen turned on their hoses and all the kids ran out in it in the middle of the street and there were maybe a couple of dozen of us out there with the water skirting, squirting up to the sky and all over us. There was maybe only six of us kids altogether running around in our bare feet and birthday suits. And I remember Molly, but then the firemen stopped squirting their hoses all of a sudden and went back in their firehouse and started playing pinochle again, just as if nothing had ever happened. While I remember Molly looked at me and ran in because I guess really we were the only ones there. This is number 11. The world is a beautiful place to be born into if you don't mind happiness, not always being so very much fun. If you don't mind a touch of hell now and then, just when everything is fine, because even in heaven, they don't sing all the time. The world is a beautiful place to be born into if you don't mind people dying all the time, or maybe only starving some of the time, which isn't half so bad if it isn't you. Oh, the world is a beautiful place to be born into if you don't much mind a few dead minds in the higher places or a bomb or two now and then in your upturned faces or such other improprieties as our name brand society is prey to with its men of distinction and its men of extinction and its priests and other patrolmen, and its various segregations and congregational investigations and other constipations that our full flesh is heir to. Yes, the world is a beautiful place of all, is the best place of all, for such a lot of things as making the fun scene and making the love scene and making the sad scene and singing low songs and having inspirations and walking around looking at everything and smelling flowers and goosing statues and even thinking and kissing people and making babies and wearing pants and waving hats, dancing and going swimming in rivers on picnics in the middle of the summer and just generally living it up. Yes, but then right in the middle of it comes a smiling mortician. He had a very wry sense of humor. Reading Yeats, I do not think of Ireland, but of midsummer New York, and of myself back then reading that copy I found on the Third Avenue, the L, with its flying fans and its signs reading, Spitting is forbidden. We remember those signs. Yes. The L careening through its third story world with its third story people in their third story doors looking as if they had never heard of the ground an old dame watering her plants or a joker in a straw putting a stick pin in his peppermint tie and looking just like he had nowhere to go but Coney Island, or an undershirted guy 
rocking in his rocker, watching the L pass by, as if he expected it to be different each time. Reading Yeats, I do not think of Arcady and of the woods which Yeats thought dead. I think instead of all the gone faces getting off at midtown places with their hats and their jobs and of that lost book I had with its blue cover and its white inside where a penciled hand had written horsemen pass by. That was the last one of Lawrence Berlinghetti. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. Okay. The next, I'm going to read some meditations, I think you would call them, by Doris Grumbach. And she um, was born in July on July 12th, 1918. She's an American novelist, memorist, biographer, literary critic, and essayist. She taught, and she was also literary editor of the New Republic for several years. She published many novels highlighting and focusing on gay and lesbian characters. And for two decades, she and her partner, Sybil, opened, operated a bookstore, Wayward Books, in Sargentville, Maine. She turned 100 in July 18. So these, what I'm going to read are she found herself having 50 days of solitude because her partner went to do some charity work and was gone for that period. And um, she writes, so what she writes about is sort of soul searching kinds of themes um, and having the ability to think and being alone was just a new experience for her. And uh, some of the Meditations, I think, are, are really good. And they're very, even though the book is not new, those meditations are still applicable to today. I had been granted 50 days in the hard winter of 1993 in which to attempt a trial return to the core of myself, staying entirely alone. My companion, Sybil, had gone away to search for books. A strong wind had disconnected the antenna to the television set. I silenced one telephone. The other was left with instructions to the caller to leave a message, but with no promise that I would return the call. I was now alone with music, books, an unpopulated cove. The ducks and gulls sensed my desire to be alone and seemed to have gone off to some other protected water further south. And with that frighteningly reflective, reflexive pronoun, myself. At first, I missed another voice, not so much a voice responsive to my unexpressed thoughts as an independent one speaking its own words. On occasion, I spoke aloud, only to surprise myself. My voice sounded low, toneless, and course, I thought it would be agreeable to be answered in another more pleasing tone, even to be contradicted gently. There was a reward for this deprivation. The absence of other voices compelled me to listen more intently to the inner one. I became aware that the interior voice, so often before stifled or stilled entirely but what I thought, by what I thought others wanted to hear or what I considered to be socially acceptable grew gratifyingly louder, more insistent. It was not that it spoke great truths 
or made important observations. No, it simply reminded me that it was present, saying what I had not heard it say in quite this way before. It began to point out the significance of the inconsequential of what I had overlooked in my hunger for what I had always before considered to be the important, the big things. The noise of the world suddenly shrank to what this new voice told me, and I became aware that with nothing to interrupt it, it now commanded my ent entire attention. I listened hard to it, more intently than I had to the talk of than I had to the talk of my friends in the world. In this way, living alone and quiet, with no vocal contributions from others, no sounds except music from beyond my own ear, I was apt to hear news of an inner terrain, an endolithic self, resembling the condition of lichens embedded in rock. My intention was to discover what was in there, no matter how deeply hidden, a process not unlike uncovering the treasure that accompanied the body of a Mayan king, hidden in a secret room in a tomb within a pyramid. I thought that if everything beyond myself was cut off, the outside turned inside, if I dug into the pile of protective rock and mortar I had erected around me in 75 years, perhaps I would be able to see if something was still living in there. Was I all outside? Was there enough inside that was vital, that would sustain and interest me in my self-enforced solitude? A treasure of fresh, fresh insight? A hoard in the Wagnerian sense? of perceptions that had accumulated unknown and unnoticed by me in the black hole of the psyche. In a learned book about words, word play and speech by Peter Farb, I discovered an interesting fact. Throughout their lives, the Palayans of Southern India speak very little. By the age of 40, they are silent. Those in their community who, consider, who continue to speak are considered abnormal, their behavior offensive. I thought about Ezra Pound, who was jailed in an insane asylum after World War II for his fascistic and anti-Semitic broadcasts to the United States. After his release, he returned to Italy, where until his death many years later, he spoke very seldom. To many people, this was a, his was a mysterious silence. One critic thought he had realized his widely aired political views had been his downfall, so he resolved to speak no more. Others believed his silence was due to an acute depression. But in an interview he gave late in his life, he hinted at an explanation. Asked why he had stopped all the activities of his productive 77 years, he said, quote, I don't work anymore. I don't do anything. I have become illiterate and unread. I simply fall into lethar lethargy and I contemplate. He told her, one strange day, words became void of meaning. Two years later, he said, I did not enter silence. Silence captured me. One evening, at the house of an acquaintance, Pound was silent. He heard his mistress, Al Garouge, say that they ought to go home. We'll never get there, he replied. He said goodbye to his host and asked him, why is it that one always happens to be where one does not want to be? His daughter, Mary Rouge, thought he spoke when he had something significant to say. 
She said, I guess about the best thing for him to do is to keep silent when people ask him silly questions. The silence was the most wonderful thing that ever happened to him. Silence is an easy etiquette. Alba Rouge thought his silence was due to his age. Old people just become increasingly silent. Natalie Barney gave a per party for his 80th birthday. Pound said nothing all evening. Barney thought he had been an eloquent listener. Samuel Beckett called on Pound later in life. Humphrey Carpenter, in who, whose excellent biography of Pound, I found all these accounts, writes, quote, the two of them had sat together in complete silence for a while. Then Beckett, suddenly able to bear it no long, longer, got to his feet, embraced Ezra, and let himself out of the house. Carpenter called them two masters of silence. One of, oh, this is longer than I thought. One of Pound's psychiatrists used a typical medical euphemism to describe his silence. It was a retardation of verbal expression. In my own silence, I often thought about Ezra Pound. I decided that contrary to what I had thought was the chattering practices of most old people, his silence was the more acceptable mode. It represented contemplation, as he said. I think it is entirely possible that a good critic like Pound, would look back on his creative work as insufficient, botched, a mess. Those were his terms when he was asked about the cantos. Not because it was, but because in hindsight, it never approached what the poet hoped it would be, thought would be, thought it might be at the time. So having written and talked so much about for so long, he chose silence as the way of self-criticism. Present silence was a way of saying no to the past. I understood this. It was also a mode of behavior in which he could discover the truth about himself, an investigation Pound may have been forced into by his imprisonment and later by his ruined life in Italy. Perhaps there was too little time during his early life of fame and acclaimed achievement to conduct this search. Later in his life, he was given the time, unpleasantly it is true, but still. In those last years, he listened eloquently instead of talking eloquently. Having mastered his poetic idiom, he abandoned it to master silence. There was resistance to the people and the world around him in this. He was, quote, a quiet rebel. Unquote. I think I'll skip this one. This is um, a reflection on planning. The days grew shorter until there were only nine hours of light. Boundaries that others usually placed upon my time disappeared, leaving me with endless days, edgeless days, though short, and seemingly endless nights. So I found that plans were useless. To plan a day began to mean to start out into it, and then to find myself on many unexpected tangents from the forward progress, the mainstream of the plan. The digressions, what I did that I had no idea I would do, turned out to be more interesting. For example, I sat at the computer, resolved to put two manuscript pages of fiction into the machine. By 
accident, my eyes lit on a bookmark from Pomegranate Press that had fallen out of a book by Israel Rosenfeld I once started and then left unfinished. The bookmark had a long, startling photograph from the archives of the Library of Congress of Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, a physician and reformer during Civil War years, and who, the text of the bookmark informed me, objected to the stricture of 19th century women's clothing. And there's a photograph of the woman that she's talking about, and she is wearing, I don't, you probably can't see it, but you can see that she's not wearing clothing of the day, and um, not at all. So there she was, in tails and rather baggy black trousers, a silk vest, dress shirt, and black tie, holding her high silk hat in her white gloved hand. An invisible timepiece hung from a gold chain around her neck and was tucked into her vest pocket. A medal was pinned to the left side of her formal jacket. Her gray-white hair was cut short and lay straight down behind her very large, protruding ears. Her face was ordinary, almost, almost androgynous. Her slightly sunken smile suggested a possible absence of teeth. Dr. Walker was a wondrous sight to behold, especially when I remembered the customary ladies' crinolines of her day. So I made my way through high snow to the locked up bookstore. In the tomb-like cold, I found some reference books and looked up her history. She was born in 1832, studied medicine at Syracuse Medical College, and graduated as a surgeon when she was 23. Ten years later, she offered her services to the Union Army as a surgeon, but was rejected because of her sex. So she joined as a nurse and served three years before she finally was commissioned an assistant surgeon. Near the end of the war, she was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, which she wore at all times on her male clothes for the rest of her life. She died in 1919 at the age of 87. There is a biography of Mary Walker published in 1962. At the, at the end of the morning, I called the local library to see if interlibrary loan could produce it for me. The librarian said she would try. I was so full of questions that I thought about her for the rest of the day. What was the effect of her determinedly anti-feminine dress upon the people she doctored? It's a good question. Was she too old to serve in the Spanish-American War? World War I? Did she marry, have children? Was she celibate or lesbian? Where did she practice? At what hospital in what city? So deep into imagining, imaginings and questions that the meander wiped out the mainstream of my plan. I never got back to the computer. This last one I'm going to read. Often in the night, I dreamed of Jude Bartlett, the young man who died this winter of AIDS in near, nearby Brooklyn. Not L-Y-N, Brooklyn with an L-I-N. He inhabited my dreams in odd ways, sometimes on his toes in a ballet. I could not identify sometimes holding my hand, once laughing at something I had said. He had been dead some months, but he was often present in my quiet house when I slept, out of his bed, and once curiously lying beside me in mine. Jean Hyland, his sister, brought Jude by ambulance from his apartment in New York City to the house she had rented around the corner from where she lived with her husband and five-year-old daughter. Kate. Before she decided to do that, this, 
her mother had said, why don't you put him in a hospital and let professionals take care of him? Jean thought otherwise. She organized the community to help with his care. Some people came to sit with him and provide for him almost constant, and provide for his almost constant needs. Others cooked or shopped. Still others stayed the night to spare Jean the cost of too many healthcare professionals. A nurse came on occasion to change his IVs and dress his sores. But most of the ordinary work was done by people who had never before had contact with a gay man suffering the last terrible afflictions of AIDS. Jude was gen a gentle, sweet fellow who had been a dancer with the Martha Graham troupe and then a chef. He was still concerned about his appearance and disturbed about his decaying and falling out teeth. Although Jean was aware that he had very little time left, she had a dentist visit him to fit him with a bridge. By the time it was made, he was too sick to wear it, but he knew it was there in the kitchen. It may have made him think that someday he would be able to put it in. Jean confessed that she hesitated at first to ask for volunteers from the community for fear of homophobia and revulsion against the disease, especially for fear that her young daughter in school might be affected. Nothing of this sort happened, or at least was ever expressed by anyone. The volunteers were faithful and efficient. All of them became very fond of the dying man. Jude's tastes were fun to cater to. When I offered him a pear for dessert, he asked shyly if he might have a bit of Stilton with it. In the refrigerator, I could find only sliced and packaged Kraft cheese, which he seemed to accept, but with his chef's delicacy still intact, even if his teeth were not, he did not eat any of it. My contributions to his entertainment was a few videos of Balanchine dances. He watched them once, but did not want to see them again. Others brought tapes of classical music, but as he grew sicker and unable to leave his bed, he lost interest in things beyond himself. His mind seemed to be on his body, the places where sores developed, his spinal abscess, the brittle tenderness in his bones. He studied his feet, which still bore the unmistakable calluses of a dancer. You have lovely feet, I said to him once, while I rubbed his fleshless body with lotion. He smiled his charming boy smile. Yes, I do, he said. Late in the afternoon on which he died, just gave out, one of his caretakers said, some of us had gone to a meeting to be instructed in the changes in his care for what was expected to be his last days. Seated there and waiting, we were informed of his death. A great sadness, a deep silence settled over us. We stayed, seated around the table, thinking about what we had done and what Jude, the suffering prematurely aged young man, had taught us about gentle mortality. We spoke of our experiences with him. Most of the narrators were young, heterosexual couples, boat builders like Jean's husband, and a few single women and men of various sexual persuasions. One of them, a gay man who had often stayed the night with Jude, told us quietly that once, when Jude was restless, he asked if there were something he might do for him. Yes, he said, you could come in bed with me and cuddle. They lay together cuddling for about an hour. After this report, there was silence. Then the wife of the boat builder, who lives down the road from us in Sargentville, said, yes, I know. Everybody needs to be cuddled sometimes. It was a fine moment. After the fever of Jude's life had cooled into death just before Thanksgiving last year, those of us who had known him had trouble adjusting to his absence from our schedule. Later in the days and nights I was alone, he was back, not only in my dreams, but also present to me. 
his sweet voice asking for the herb tea he was too weak to drink and the exotic foods he remembered but can no longer eat. Fran Lebowitz denied there was such a thing as inner peace. There is only nervousness uh, or death, she wrote. I thought not. Despite the outer turmoil created by the world, the nervousness, if one turns one's back on it, there are moments of peace. And the last poems I am going to read are from the A Child's Garden of Verses. And I loved that book growing up. Um, that book, and I had a book called The Golden Bible, which was a child's, a, for a child's edition of the Bible. And on the cover, I can still picture the, the drawing, it was of an old man with a long beard uh, sitting on something in the clouds. And that was my vision of God for many years. My um, daughter, Nava, uh, has both books now, and um, she even reads them once in a while. So Robert Louis Stevenson was... Very, was, not only wrote poetry, he also wrote um, a Treasure Island, he wrote The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Mr. Hyde, and, um, and Kidnap. Those are notable works. He did a lot more writing than that. And I, in addition to these, I'm going to read to you the requiem that Stevenson wanted inscribed on his tomb. Under the wide and starry sky, dig the grave and let me lie. Glad did I live and gladly die, and I laid me down with a will. This be the verse you gave, grave, you grave for me. Here he lies where he longed to be. Home is the sailor, home from sea, and the hunter home from the hill. That's a very interesting rhyming scheme. And this is the first poem I'm going to read, and I will, unless you are tired of hearing them, um, I may not get through all of them. It's called Bed in Summer. In winter, I get up at night and dress by yellow candlelight. In summer, quite the other way, I have to go to bed by day. I have to go to bed and see the birds still hopping on the tree, or hear the grown-up people's feet still going past me in the street. And does it not seem hard to you when all the sky is clear and blue and I should like so much to play, I have to go to bed by day. I love that poem. This is, uh, the, his poetry is much easier to read than Lawrence Ferlinghetti's because Lawrence Ferlinghetti does not write, he does not write his poetry in sentences in, in you know, that end with a period. They are broken up on the page. And some of, it's rare that you will find um, rhyming uh, schemes. Um, now, with Robert Louis Stevenson, it's the opposite, and it's, you know, A-B-A-B -B or A-A-B-B. -B. Um, so some of them are pretty short. This is at the seaside. When I was down beside the sea, a wooden spade they gave to me to dig the sandy shore. My holes were empty like a cup. In every hole the sea came up till it could come no more. The whole duty of children. A child should always say what's true and speak when he is spoken to and behave mannerly at table at least as far as he is able. 
a thought. It is very nice to think the world is full of meat and drink, with little children saying grace in every Christian kind of place. Happy thought. The world is so full of a number of things, I'm sure we should all be as happy as kings. Looking forward. When I am grown to man's estate, I shall be very proud and great and tell the other girls and boys not to meddle with my toys. <laughs> That's a funny one. I read it again. Looking forward. When I am grown to man's estate, I shall be very proud and great and tell the other girls and boys not to meddle with my toys. Oh, come on. This is called Little Land. No, these are poems from Little, Little Land. When at home alone I sit and am very tired of it, I have to just shut my eyes to go sailing through the skies, to go sailing far away to the pleasant land of play, to the fairy land afar where the little people are, where the clover tops are trees and the rain pools are the seas and the leaves like little ships sail about on tiny trips and above the daisy tree through the grasses, high or head the bumblebee hums and passes. In that forest to and fro, I can wander, I can go, see the spider and the fly and the ants go marching by, carrying parcels with their feet down the green and grassy street. I can in the sorrel sit where the lady bird alit. I can climb the jointed grass and on high see the greater swallows pass in the sky. And the round sun rolling by, heeding no such things as I. Through that forest I can pass till as in a looking glass, hummingbird fly and daisy tree and my tiny self I see. Painted very clear and neat on the rain pool at my feet, should a leaflet come to land, drifting near to where I stand. Straight, I'll board that tiny boat, round the rain pool, see to float. Little thoughtful creatures sit on the grassy coasts of it. Little things with lovely eyes see me sailing with surprise. Some are clad in armor green. These have sure to battle beam. Some are pied with every hue, black and crimson, gold and blue. Some have wings and swift are gone, but they all look kindly on. When my eyes I once again open and see all things plain, high bare walls, great bare floor, great big knobs on drawer and door, great big people perched on chairs, stitching tucks and mending tears, each a hill that I could climb and talking nonsense all the time. Oh dear me that I could be a sailor on the rain pool sea, a climber in the clover tree, and just come back a sleepy head late at night to go to bed. Okay, I'm just going to read these last two. Yes, I'm going to read one more or two more. Up into the cherry tree, who should climb but little me? I held the trunk with both my hands and looked abroad in foreign lands. I saw the next door garden lie adorned with flowers before my eye and many pleasant places more that I had never seen before. I saw the dimpling river pass and be the sky's blue looking glass. 
The dusty roads go up and down with people tramping into town. If I could find a higher tree further and further, I should see to where the grown-up river slips into the sea among the ships, to where the road on either, so either hand lead onward into fairyland, where all the children dine at five and all the playthings come alive. And the last one is my shadow. I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me, and what can be the use of him is more than I can see. He is very, very like me from the heels up to the head, and I see him jump before me when I jump into my bed. The funniest thing about him is the way he likes to grow. Not at all like proper children, which is always very slow, for he sometimes shoots up taller like an Indian rubber ball, and he sometimes goes so little that there's none of him at all. He hasn't got a notion of how children ought to play and can only make a fool of me in every sort of way. He stays so close behind me, he's a coward, you see. I would think shame to stick to Nursie as that shadow sticks to me. One morning, very early, before the sun was up, I rose and found the shining dew on every buttercup. But my lazy little shadow, like an errant sleepy head, had stayed at home behind me and was fast asleep in bed. <laughs>